Hello there, I'm Rory Calhoun, and welcome to Western Star Theater. Robert Colbert stars in a story about the early days of mining in Nevada. At that time, two virtues were important in a man, imagination and courage. John Yank, Van Dusen, and Andrew Peasley proved they had both in the Grotto of Death. I'm telling you, Bennett, the mud will never hold those timbers. You've got to have concrete. Uh, will you stop dogging me, Yank? I know what I'm doing. And I know this drift. The water pressure's building up at the 800-foot level. Can you imagine what it's like down here at 2,100 feet? Exactly. That's why I want to finish up and get the men out of there today. Another day's delay pouring concrete would be dangerous. But the angle of the decline is greater on this side of the drift. The force of that water makes soup out of that mud and push it right out. The other bulkheads have always held up with mud. Yeah. That does it, Mr. Bennett. Fine, let's get going. I haven't had any breakfast yet. Bennett, listen to me. No, you listen to me. Somewhere along the line, you get the notion you're some sort of mining expert. Will you not? You're the crew chief, and that's all. I'm the foreman, hear me. You, you rock-headed old jackass. I get out of here. You better get out of here. I don't want to be here when that bulkhead goes and drowns like a rat. There was your cock, and I get going. Look, Bennett, for the love of Pete, will you listen to reason? I've heard all I want to hear. What do you want to do, endanger the lives of every man down there? I know the safety rules. I've been working the mines for nearly 30 years. I've risked my own life for my men many a time, and I'll do it again if I have to. Well, you may have to, you old rockhead, if that bulkhead goes. Maybe you don't like it here, Mr. Van Dusen. Maybe you'd like to quit. Maybe I would. As of now. Well, they're at it again. Fourth time this month. Now, oh, let's see now, where was I? Oh, yes. <laughs> so the weather says, my, my, Mr. Pettick, and all the time I thought you was a foreign gent. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter, Danny boy? Look at him, he's red as a cherry. <laughs> oh, Danny, if you're going to be a real miner, you got to toughen up those calf ears of yours. Ain't much to do down in that black hole but swing a pick, tell widow stories. <laughs> Which reminds me, did you ever hear the story about the widow that had the cow? Morning, fellas. Morning, ma'am. Morning, ma'am. Ma Isn't Hank here yet? Oh, uh, well, uh, yes, he was just here, but, uh, uh, but he left. Oh, but I thought he was on the morning shift. Uh, he was, ma'am, but you see, uh... Yank quit, Miss Bennett. Again? Well, you pawn him. They had another fierce argument. This time, Yank looked mad enough to stay quit. Do you know where he went? He went over that way, Miss Bennett. Probably over to Peasley. They're very good friends, you know. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, fellas. It's time to go to work now. Danny! 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 Uh, you forgot your extra socks. Thanks, Ma. You didn't have to come all the way out here. A couple of hours in that damp hole down there and your socks will get soaking wet. You know, your father died because of the dampness all the time down there. I know, Ma. You put those dry ones on later, you hear? Sure, Ma. Come on, Daddy boy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Paisley, but I've told you before. The company requires a pipe fitter to have a certificate. Now, I'd like to put you on, but I didn't make the rules, you know. But I'm a good pipe fitter, Mr. Bennett. Ask Yank Van Dusen. You ask him. He quit today. Oh, oh that man, Peasley. He just doesn't understand that pipe fitting in a mine is different than being a, a fixer-upper like he is. <laughs> Have you caulked up that number three bulkhead in the West Rift? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Boyle. First thing this morning. As a matter of fact, we put in a double bulkhead. Good. That water pressure's building up down there. We don't want to take any chances. You better have Van Dusen and make a check every hour on the hour of that number three. Oh, uh... Well, uh, Mr. Boyle... I'll have to assign somebody else to that now. Why? Van Dusen's the best man we've got for ferreting out trouble. 
Man's got a nose for it. Well, he quit this morning, Mr. Boyle. You two been at it again. He claimed that we ought to concrete up that bulkhead. Now, that would take three times as long to do. Besides, mud has always held up before. I agree with you. Double bulkhead, that should hold. Now, that's exactly what I told him, Mr. Boyle. But you know, you and Van Dusen have got to call a truce sooner or later. What's going to happen when he marries your daughter? Oh, my heart rattles in my chest bones at the thought of it, sir. <laughs> All right, who are you going to send down to keep a watch on number three? The very best man available, Mr. Boyle. Me, that's who. Love of Pete, why do you always have to do that when you get your dander up? Why, I ask you, young Van Dusen, do you always have to come to Mr. Peasley's and burst the bottle when your dander is up? Well, a man's got a right. A man's got no right to quit his job just one month before us to take on the responsibility of a wife. I've never seen such stubborn, hard-nosed men like you and my father. Like two mad banshees you act, always picking at one another and... You got the McDevil in yours. Now, nah, young... Uh... <coughs> Hello, Andy. Mr. Peasley. What's the matter, Ben, to turn you down again? The ninth time. Oh, that narrow-minded old walrus. Why, he can't see beyond the end of that big red nose of his. Now, Yank. Have a snort, Andy. You've had enough snorts for the day, Yank Van Dusen. I'll fix us a cup of coffee. Thanks, Mr. Peasley. We'd love some. Come on, Yank. Oh, who are you, boss? Oh, we aren't even married yet. I think you Bennets were born given orders. How do you know I would like some coffee? Sure, now would you be caring for some coffee, Mr. Van Dusen? Well, now I don't know. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, Fletcher, I want you to make a routine check of both these pumps today, huh? Yes, sir, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Peasley? Yeah? What's this? <laughs> That's a brainstorm of mine, but I haven't worked it out yet. That's a cow milker. <laughs> It's, uh, it's kind of automatic. Really? Yeah, but don't work. <laughs> you know what happened? I tried it out on Mrs. Wilson's Guernsey. Pinched the cow and she kicked me almost into the next county. <laughs> Andy invents things. I didn't know that. Oh, well, they're just little things. Well, here, I'll show you. Flour mixer. Yeah. Put your milk, flour in there. Turn this handle. Why, that's wonderful, Mr. Peasley. You like it? Yes. Seems so much simpler than beating the flour with a big spoon. Well, it's yours, a wedding present. Why, thank you, Mr. Peasley. Look, Yank, our first wedding gift. Thanks, Andy. You know, all my life I've fiddled with scraps of metal, pieces of pipe, all kinds of junk. Just hoping once I'd come up with something worthwhile. I can't even get a decent job as a pipe fitter. I guess I'll always be an ordinary handyman like my pa. You know, he dreamed of inventing something just once, important. And he died fixing a rusty handle on a water pump. I bet he was a wonderful man. Yeah, he was. Huh? The coffee ought to be ready, huh? I don't like the way the heat is rising on this level. After I inspect the bulkhead, we'd better... The mud's breaking up. The whole bulkhead's coming apart. You get up there and you tell Fletcher to get them water pumps ready. We'll be leading them. I'll be warning the men. The boat is turning fast. Get out. <laughs> so there I was, standing slap dab in the middle of these two old biddies. <laughs> Listen. Get out! Get out! 
Dad, he'll put you on again. Me ask that old crowbait for my job back? Not on your pretty life, I would. That's the best. Boyle, that pump isn't taking the water off fast enough. If their air pipe gets flooded... I know. I sent Riker down to check the water level. Doesn't look good from here. That water pressure's been building up for a week. Listen, you know that drift better than anybody. How far do you think that water's reached? Well, the crew should be about here in the East Drift, which is 1,500 feet back from the 2,100-foot station. Yeah. Now, here's number three bulkhead that gave out. Well, I figured that the water level should be about here now. Another hour should be here. After that, it's only a matter of minutes till it reaches the airport. Then they either drown or they suffocate. Hey, look. Right. Steve, Doctor. Water must have created a steam trap at the bottom of the drift. Well, it must be hell down there. Mr. Boyle! Mr. Boyle! Take him to the shack. It's the pumps! They're coming! I think this left relief valve is froze. Well, don't be telling me about it. Go ahead and fix it. Well, it's going to take a little time to fix it. How much time? Oh, three hours, maybe four. Three or four hours? Well, if those men will be dead in three or four hours. Well, I'll do the best I can. Boyle. Yeah. It pumps, any kind of pumps. Uh, That's look, my special. By the time they get those pumps repaired, their air supply might be cut off. Boyle, you've got to let me try to get an extension pipe through to them. It'll give us time to work. No. But that extension pipe is their only chance. But burn out your insides down there, and you know it. You wouldn't stand a chance. Mr. Boyle, where's my father? I, I can't find him. He's down there with the men, Ursula. Dad? Oh, no. I'm sorry, darling. I didn't know he was down there either. But we'll get him out. Somehow. If I could just figure a way to keep the air cool that I breathe down there. A long hose or something. Air. Cool air. There's a steam trap built up in that shaft. It's as hot as fire down there. We'd sear the lungs of anybody that went in there. And would suffocate in a matter of minutes. But if I could get through with that extension pipe for their air supply, we might be able to keep them alive long enough to get this pump working. But I can't breathe that hot air. Air, cool air. Yank, I got an idea. Well, what is it? And it'll work. Come on over to the house. Well, my Fletcher's taking that apart. Have one of the men cut a new gasket. It'll save an hour, and it'll work. I don't understand. Well, I'll explain it to you later. Here, you see those two glasses back there? Take that glass cutter, cut the bottoms out of them, smooth off the rough edges. Miss Banner, take that piece of leather, will you please? And cut me a hole in the center of that. No, exactly. And cut it exactly this. 13 inches in diameter. It's sort of a metal headgear, then. That's right. Well, here's how it works. This will hold about five pounds of ice. Ice contains some oxygen. 
be held in place by this metal screen. Now, do you get this on? We'll tie these leather straps around your chest. That'll keep it practically airtight. As you breathe, air will come down through here. Passes through the ice. It'll keep the air you're breathing cool. Do you think it'll work? Well, it should. But then again, I thought the automatic cow milker would, too. Yeah. Well, we'll try it. Personally, you get some ice and bring it to the mine. Now, hurry. Well, let's go. No, absolutely no. I will not risk the life of another man down there. Look, that pump still isn't working. And I have got to get that pipe down there to those men. That is a ridiculous looking contraption. Here's the ice, Yak. Oh, good. And that ice is supposed to keep your air cool while you're down there? That's why I figure, Mr. Boyle. All right, Van Dusen, go ahead. And let Peasley get to work on those pumps, will you? If anybody can fix them, he can. See what you can do, Mr. Oh, yeah. Wait. Take care. It's going to work. I know it. <laughs> All right, Andy, help me with this one. Let's go. Take it easy. How that one, Mr. Boyle? Yeah. <laughs> All right, just said. All right, come on. Now, low break. Now, watch your head. That's it. Now, if you see you're not going to make it, turn back. Good luck, Jack. The best of luck. There, give me that wrench. I'll show you how to fix it. No wonder. Oh. 
work it again. Beasley fix that too. All right, man, now that we've got those pumps working, we'll have you out of here in no time. And the drinks will be on Bennett. <laughs> Somebody give me a hand with this thing. I'll never forget. Thank Beasley, Mr. Boyle. I never could have made it without that metal helmet of his. Well, you were a first class pipe fitter, Mr. Beasley. You've got a job with the Alta Mine Company any time you want it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, Mr. Boyle. Yeah? I'm quitting as foreman. What? Yankee, he ought to be foreman. What are you bleating about now, you old walrus? Well, if I'd have listened to you in the first place, none of this would have happened. Well, then why don't you open up those big red ears of yours and quit being so gall darn stubborn? Oh, oh, oh look who's calling stubborn. Yeah, you're stubborn, you rock-headed, ornery old mule. Are you calling me a mule now? What are you complaining about? It's the mule ought to be insulted. Oh, I've got to bust your head wide open. That'll be the day. Yeah. <laughs> That's just what I was needing. A little walk. Now listen, both of you pig-headed hyenas. If you think I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you two tongue lashing each other, you got another thing coming. Now let's be off before you catch your death of cold. March. <laughs> <laughs> The courage and imagination of Yank Van Dusen and Andrew Peasley averted a mine tragedy. Years later, Harry Gorham recorded the incident in his book, My Memories of the Comstock. Thank you. 